Greetings. My name is Karen Coonrod, and I've been invited by Kyle Bass, the Associate Artistic Director of Syracuse Stage, to deliver a little talk to you about Walt Whitman. Uh, a few months ago, Kyle and I talked together. He had witnessed the virtual production that my theater company did uh, called More or Less I Am, which was drawn from Whitman's poem, Song of Myself. So he thought that this would be um, interesting in conjunction with the play that you're gonna be witnessing, I and You by Lauren Gunderson. Um, so I thought I would talk in these three sections. I, I thought I would, um, first of all, give a little bit of context for Whitman, uh, which is, always exciting and connections with our own time. Um, and then talk a little bit about what the theater company did uh, in terms of how we transformed the poem into a theater piece. And and then third, I, I thought I would uh, talk about a few resonances in our own time and uh, even connected to the play. Um, why Whitman's presence is an enduring one. So first of all, some some background on Whitman. Um, he wrote this poem, which is referenced in the play, I and You, called Song of Myself, when he was 36 years old in 1855. He wrote it in Brooklyn, New York. He published it himself. And it was an extraordinary moment. It was the the, middle point of a very volatile decade, which uh, started with the Fugitive Slave Act and ended um, with the beginning of the Civil War in 1860. So um, Whitman had been in New Orleans in the late 40s with his brother. He was a newspaper man, so he was accustomed to writing and hitting deadlines and uh, writing about events and so forth, and you know all kinds of um, anecdotes and things that he observed in city life, very dedicated to the urban life. Um, I think that in New Orleans there were some uh, tremendous experiences that he had. He was only there a short time in 1848, something like that, and then started gathering um, thoughts. I, I, I think with the Fugitive Slave Act that happened in 1850 and the way the country was polarized, he started, he was very afraid that the American experiment would fall apart and hadn't even been a hundred years. And he was living in fear of that. Um, not unlike our own time, actually. Um, so he wanted to write something. He wanted to make a great masterpiece, something that would be uh, listened to, something that would express what America could be in its full blossoming democracy. And um, recently, interestingly, I was at the Beinecke uh, at Yale where I teach and I uh, went into the archives and saw a little notebook from 1850 in his hand. Um, and he was starting to write things that later found their way into Song of Myself. Mostly he was interested in the variety of, um, of occupations, you know, in that particular notebook. He's talking about the, the five friendly matrons, the, the president, the, the, the variety of, uh, occupations in the country and celebrating them, putting them side by side, people that normally might not be side by side, um, the opium eater um, and the, um, the lunatic and the, the farmer, you know, all these people right there on the page. So he, he was really giving voice um, and wanting to create um, a, 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 something that could not be forgotten, you know? And so it turned out, I, I think at one point he wasn't sure whether it would be a play or an opera or what it would be, but in fact, it, it 
emerged, it became a poem. And um, in uh, and he he self published uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in on ninety nine Ryerson Street uh, in July, uh, and uh, it went out on the scene. So it's it's a piece of work that he continued to work at and develop throughout his life. Um, but I I think it's um, extraordinary how modern it is it's um and i'll just talk about some of those things a little bit later um so that's his background when 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 i was considering to do to put the poem into the theater um and it's interesting to think that the theater was not far away i mean i feel that he's a real theater man even though he wrote he's known for his writing of poetry he's He's exhilarating. He's he's a force, and he um, is provocative and ahead of his time. Um, when he burst on the scene, you know, in 1855 with the piece, it not only was a radical piece of work, but it also broke all the conventions of poetry in that time. Uh, so. When I was thinking about it in 2003, four, five, those early 2000s, the, the country was polarized and not to the extent it is now, but I was concerned and I was thinking about it. And, and I thought, gosh, Whitman is somebody to bring uh, to the stage. That, wouldn't that be exciting? Would, what could that be? And I found um, at Barge Music in Brooklyn, I went to a concert of uh, a string quartet called Brooklyn Rider. And in it, uh, the final piece in that evening was something that had been composed by Colin Jacobson, the first violinist. And when I heard that, I think it was called Brooklyn, Brooklynenia or something like that, some, something celebrating Brooklyn life. And it was so exuberant and so um, uh, fine, also in its in its intricacy, and yet um, extravagant and exuberant in its in its um, spirit. That afterwards, I went to see them and I said, "You guys, we have to we have to do something. There's something, you know. I I have this idea of a Walt Whitman poem coming into uh, into the flesh and." maybe we should collaborate. So we started to talk. So Colin Jacobson, his brother, Eric Jacobson, and then they suggested that we bring Kyle Santa, beautiful guitarist who um, these guys direct, these guys uh, perform with Yo-Yo Ma and they've been on the Silk Road um, tour and all kinds of places. They're, they're um, extremely well known now. And, uh, and then they also brought in Alex Sop, the, the, wonderful flautist. And so these four became the composers. Um, we got together, I think it was in 2007, and read through the poem with, with several actors, Michael Potts being one, and Jorge Rubio another, Elliot Villar another. And, and we read through, I had gone through the process of excising um, chunks so that we wouldn't do the entire poem. I didn't think it was all uh, it, we didn't need to be dutiful. I just wanted to to bring to the fore what what was calling us, you know. So uh, in a in a two week workshop, we um, worked on the the poetry and the music, bringing it together, and then actually testing some things out and and carefully and slowly testing over several years until we started performing around New York and actually emerged um, in our opening night uh, in 2010 at, at Barge Music, again in Brooklyn, um, and then went around New York City uh, in various places, uh, in Brooklyn, Manhattan, of course the birthplace and so forth, to uh, present Whitman's words to the public free of charge. So, uh, 
some of some of the text was uh, a standalone text recitation, some of it with chorus, some of it sung, and some of it with music uh, underneath, and sometimes no text and and just the music. So that's that's how we uh, we called it more or less I am, um, which is um, a line that he writes after a very long catalog of the occupations of the people of the Americas. Um, I had been hungry to, to really give expression to what it is to be American and the joy of, of this citizenship and the joy of the citizenship being really a country of immigrants and the tremendous variety um, and force and potential of this country. So um, when during the pandemic, we had uh, one of our um, performances canceled. Um, we instead turned it into a virtual performance. And um, so it turned into something where, where basically the theater meets film. Uh, we were not dutiful to the live performance, but rather uh, found sections from it and even added a little bit to it, but created something that um, uh, could speak to our time of, of our being together alone, alone together, as Beckett says, but also in our lockdown mode and yet working together over and bringing 60 performers together over Zoom um, and through iPhones and what have you to uh, create this piece. And so Kyle witnessed that and thought, well, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about Whitman. <laughs> um, so that brings me to to think about his resonance now, and um, how important he is, really, as a a beautiful soul, a voice um, that it was very much ahead of his time, uh, an ambitious voice, a voice that. Uh, brought together the individual and the community in tension with the community, but one not being greater than the other. And um, it's a huge and a beautiful message for our own time that um, where we've seen the extremity of individualism, but we need to now acquiesce to the the challenges and the demands of the group and of this uh, infinite variety in this community and to trust that our individuality will come forward when we are connected as a community. And this is very much what Whitman was um, conveying and trying to fight the polarization of his own decade in the 1850s. Um, so, you know, we, when I think about this performance that you will be witnessing, um, this lovely performance by these two actors, um, and you know, and the characters Anthony and Caroline, who learn more and more and talk about the pronouns and talk about um, Whitman throughout and their assignment, I think of first of all I and you, and the fact that the poem song myself begins with the pronoun I and ends with the pronoun you. Um, that's, you know, the, the poem, the poem I think was an extravagant love letter to his reader, um, to his reader in that moment and to his reader of the future. And any great poet is always thinking about um, legacy. And it's always thinking about the masses of people that will be uh, leaning in to the, um, the words and speaking them aloud. And um, so that the poem begins with, I celebrate myself and what I assume, you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. <laughs> That's just wild. <laughs> That's wild. He wrote it in 1855, every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. So 
I find that um, modern and sexy and um, generous and surprising trickster, you know, I, all of those things. Um, it's like a little prologue for the entire poem, actually, because that little be, that little uh, opening starts with I and ends with you. But the entire poem ends with you. Um, the last line is, I stop somewhere waiting for you. And in in at the end of the poem, this long, long cosmic poem. Um, that deals with the city and deals with the cosmos and deals with the individual and deals with the group. Um, so many things going on and celebrating what it is to be an American. He ends it with you, no punctuation, so that it's an open-ended poem that perhaps goes back to the beginning. So perhaps there's circularity in this. And, um, and in, in that way, you know, in, in in addition to every other way that this this uh, poem breaks out on the scene, it's very innovative and um, uh, radical in the sense, yes, of wild and attention getting, but also in the sense of going to the roots of what it is to be an American, going into the ground, into the roots of what it is to be a citizen of these new continents the interdependence of this um, uh, this great new, uh, these Americas, and in particular, how the United States of America uh, uh, can be a, a clarion call for a new world or order in a way. Um, anyway, I, I, I thought I would read, you know, a, a, a couple of of poems from the song of myself um, that m would resonate with uh, what you're going to see. And then um, just maybe briefly uh, have a word or two about them. But the first is, is near the beginning and connects quickly with, with the play that you're going to witness, I and you. Um, so He's talking about the talkers were talking, everybody was talking so much. And then he says, to elaborate is no avail. Learned and unlearned feel that it is so. Sure as the most certain sure, plum in the uprights, well entreated, braced in the beams, stout as a horse, affectionate, haughty, electrical, I, and this mystery, here we stand. So he's talking about um, the strength of the architecture of, of, of his vision, of this vision for America, this vision that he sees and sees even into being, into expression. Um, wild and thrilling, actually. Um, later on, in the midst of, uh, and this is this is a line that in the, the piece that uh, I adapted from, in the piece that I made from, with my collaborators, uh, more or less I am, from Song of Myself, um, Inside the marketplace, we call it, or it's the catalog of all the different genres of, of occupations, all the occupations of the people of the Americas, um, there's one line that is very haunting to me, and it is, the young fellow drives the express wagon. I love him, though I do not know him. And I love that because when we did it, uh, there was really uh, beautiful, uh, energetic music uh, driven by the guitar on playing underneath and driving more and more urgently and 
energetically uh, forward. And then this line is spoken and each of the actors in the piece um, repeats that line. I love him, though I do not know him. And it's, it's so Whitman, I think. He, of course, the young man that he's drawn to um, that we can uh, uh, giggle at or, or smile at or, or admire. And, uh, and yet that he says, I don't know him. And yet I love him. It's so um, expressive of Whitman's beautiful soul. Um, and so I pulled that out and, you know, had each of the performers speak that line. Um, the end of this section is very striking because he talks not only about all the people in the the country and in the continent, but but also the living and the dead and the old and the young and bringing everybody together. And, and this is something um, that is very dear to my heart too and um, an urge that I feel. Uh, and it becomes more urgent even in our own time in this extraordinary uh, time of paradigmatic change actually. The city sleeps and the country sleeps the living sleep for their time, the dead sleep for their time. The old husband sleeps by his wife and the young husband sleeps by his wife. And these one and all tend inward to me and I tend outward to them. And such as it is to be of these more or less, I am. So the poet in his sly existential claim and connecting with all manner of folks um, ends this very, very long catalog of, you know, the five friendly matrons and the spinning girl and the duck shooter and all these people that normally would not be side by side, but Whitman places them side by side on the page. And we, in our piece, place them right next to each other, um, connecting and calling upon these, all these persons and how the poet can get inside these bodies and, um, and know them in a really um, uh, wild way, you know, and, and present them, present them to themselves, to us. Um, another, another portion of the poem later on, which is so beautiful and so wild in, in our performance, it was um, uh, spoken by, um, very rhythmically by Trinidadian, beautiful performer called Michael Rogers, a very good friend of mine and part of our company from the get-go. Um, and he says, uh, I speak the password primeval. I give the sign of democracy. By God, I will accept nothing which all cannot have their counterpart, counterpart of on the same terms. Through me, many long, dumb voices, voices of the interminable generations of slaves, voices of prostitutes and of deformed persons, voices of the diseased and despairing and of thieves and dwarves, voices of cycles of preparation and accretion, and so on. And, um, it, it's just thrilling, the words, and more thrilling when it's spoken out. Um, there, I just spoke it to you, but imagine, imagine an extraordinary performer <laughs> speaking it to the steel drum, you know, the steel drum, giving it its uh, kind of rhythmic um, architecture and um, 
this uh, beautiful performer speaking these words and calling us through his own person um, to Whitman's um, words, past, present, future. Um, Here I stand, this mystery, and I. Um, I and this mystery. So um, another one that is that is really beautiful because because Whitman was so urban. Um, he lived in New York. He uh, he lived in Brooklyn. He worked in New York and in Brooklyn. He was a newspaper man. Um, so the sights of the city, he loved the opera, he loved the theater, he was walking up and down the Bowery, he was always on the, you know, not too far from where I live, I'm speaking to you from New York City, and um, so here's something that when we uh, created this piece, and in particular when we did it for the, during pandemic time, um, bringing together so many people from around the globe, from, from Lima, Peru, Mumbai, uh, Shanghai, uh, Paris, uh, Washington, D.C., and of course, New York. So from New York to the world. Um, and so this is what we spoke. This is, here it is in English, um, though we, we did it in many different languages, um, including Yiddish and um, uh, Russian, French, Italian, all kinds. But here it is in English. This is the city, and I am one of the citizens. Whatever interests the rest, interests me. Politics, churches, newspapers, schools, benevolent societies, improvements, banks, tariffs, steamships, factories, markets, stocks and stores, and real estate, and personal estate. I remember when we first um, did this poem, we, you know, the, the, the poem speaks to being very political, wants to be very political and shout out, you know, um, to its audience um, for a better kind of living, for a more generous um, view on life. But it also is metaphysical, which is what I love, you know, the poets, the, the poets that I love operate on those three levels, the personal, the political, and uh, the metaphysical. So there he is talking about real estate and personal estate. Um, the first time we did it in 2010, uh, that particular poem, I also had it spoken in Spanish. That was the first time that we included um, another language and we, we there were two places where we had Spanish and this was one of them because there was some uproar in Arizona about uh, Latino um, people not being citizens. Uh, I remember that so I thought well one of our students from the Wadley School um, was in the piece and I said why don't you just speak this in Spanish from the back of the house um, so it was pretty thrilling, actually, from an, in Barge Music to hear um, this young man speak this. I am a citizen. Whatever interests the rest, interests me. This is the city. Um, yeah, so there are, um, then, of course, there is one more that I thought I would speak and that is, um, yes, this this extraordinary poem that is just kind of weird <laughs> because it's so uh, it's so beyond. Uh, but it it shows how uh, Whitman's huge force and cosmic kind of you know the the the. M microcosm and the macrocosm. I, I remember being at the Folger when uh, my company was doing um, uh, our Elizabeth play, Tex and Beheadings, and, and I was taken into the library and I got to see the little tiny 
um, book of Shakespeare sonnets that Whitman used to carry around inside his pocket. And I could not believe it. It was just like, um, just unbelievable. Um, I was looking to see if he had annotated it and he hadn't. Or maybe, maybe there was one lot, but he certainly, maybe there were a few little things, but not much. Um, but it was well-worn, it was a little green book of sonnets and beautiful. Anyway, he, he uh, why did I say that? I, I don't know, he's, he's he, uh, I, I guess I was thinking of microcosm and macrocosm and thinking of how uh, Shakespeare does that very same thing in, in the uh, universe is, in the, in the self is, um, the entire universe and in the universe is the self. So here he says, immense have been the preparations for me, faithful and friendly, the arms that have helped me. Cycles ferried my cradle, rowing and rowing like cheerful boatmen. For room to me, stars kept aside in their own rings. They sent influences to look after what was to hold me. and. We turn this into a song, and it continues. Um, just uh, uh, finishing, actually, this was the penultimate number, finish uh, in the evening of our Whitman um, from Song of Myself. And just to, it, it's basically a gratitude. And um, the beauty of, of living in gratitude and uh, where one can go surprisingly when one lives in that place. So um, I, I thought I would just end with, you know, one could go on and on talking about Whitman and um, resonances, but um, I think one thing, it, this this poet, for me, is like a like a father, like a grandfather, like a great grandfather. I mean, he's very very special and um, and speaks to the the country and speaks and is very modern still. He's still ahead of us. Um, and he does say uh, provocatively. He's prophetic, you know. All poets, all great poets are. And he says. And I follow you, whoever you are, from the present hour. My words itch at your ears till you understand them. Walt Whitman, 1855. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the show.